How does the food you eat contribute to your overall health? Do supplements help prevent disease? For the past 25 years, the Linus Pauling Institute has served as a trusted research hub for Oregon State University. Our mission is to promote optimal health through cutting edge nutrition research and trusted public outreach. Our work bridges multiple disciplines to understand the connection between dietary components and optimal health. Welcome to the Linus Pauling Institute's webinar series. Hi everyone, good afternoon or good evening or uh, good morning depending where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Emily Ho and I'm the director of the Linus Pauling Institute and I want to welcome you to the Linus Pauling Institute's second webcast of 2021. Um, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the Institute at Oregon State University, and we've kicked off this celebratory year in February with our Vitamin C and Health um, New Frontiers webinar that was presented in honor of Linus Pauling's birthday. If you missed it, the recording is still available online, and the link is on our web website. Uh, there are going to be more webinars coming uh, later this year. Uh, one will come up early this summer in July, and they'll continue uh, into the fall. So today, uh, we're continuing our webinar series with the latest research with vitamins. Um, today, we're highlighting vitamin D. This webinar is Why Healthy Immune System Needs Vitamin D with our presenter, Dr. Adrian Gompart. Um, as a note, uh, this entire webinar will also have uh, auto closed captioning for you for those who need it. Uh, so as usual, our turnout for today's uh, event is, is really impressive. We have over 1,200 people registered for this webcast and we're thrilled to see such an uh, incredible interest uh, in this topic. So without further ado, but before we get to the main event, uh, I'd like to take a moment here and let our moderator, Dr. Alexander Michaels, uh, take the stage. Hi, everyone. I'm back. Hi. Uh, thank you, Emily, for that introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Alexander Michaels, as Emily said, and I'm a researcher and communications officer at the Linus Pauling Institute. And I'm going to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. Um, the last webinar I did was our, our webinar on vitamin C, as Emily mentioned, and that was a really fun webinar to do. Uh, uh, getting four vitamin C experts in a room together just to, to talk about the latest research was, was just amazing. I'm still working through all the questions uh, from that event. So today's webinar is focused on vitamin D, a uh, hot topic in the world today. Uh, the webinar is going to consist of two parts. The first part will be a presentation by Dr. Gombart followed by a Q&A session. And we hope to have everything wrapped up by 5 p.m., so we will have to get going quickly. Um, before I get started, I'm gonna do a, a quick rundown of how our Q&A system works. Uh, if you look below, below me here, there's a Q&A button. The, if you have a question for the speaker, uh, you, know, you can submit it in the Q&A section, and we will try to get to it during the talk, um, or sorry, after the talk. Uh, but we do have 200 questions submitted already before uh, the event. So I'm going to apologize in advance if I can't get to all of them in time. Um, so at this point, I'm going to ask Dr. Gombart to turn on his camera. And we can uh, get to an introduction here. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adrian Fritz Gombart. I will be referring to him as Fritz during most of this talk um, uh, as our speaker today. Dr. Gombart came to the Linus Pauling Institute in 2008 when he also joined the biochemistry and biophysics department at Oregon State University. And before coming to OSU, Dr. Gombart completed his postdoctoral research in hematology and oncology at the Cedar Sinai Medical Center and the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in Los Angeles. Um, he obtained his PhD in microbiology at the University of Washington in Seattle. Fritz has several research projects uh, going throughout the years, um, and most of them funded by uh, different agencies within the National Institutes of Health. He's also conducted research trials, including a recent trial that I was help, happy to help with, uh, a clinical trial um, with, with funding from the supplement industry. <clears throat> his research focuses on the 
understanding the impact of vitamin D and other micronutrients in the immune system, which has been an unbelievably important topic in recent years and months. And I think at that, I'm just going to let Fritz take it from here. Hey, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Alex. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, perhaps we should just go ahead and get to the talk and then uh, let people ask questions. Okay, I'm gonna talk about why a healthy immune system needs vitamin D. Overview of the talk um, that uh, shown here on the slide will be uh, covering key questions. Um, one is what is vitamin D and how do we get it? Vitamin D3 or vitamin D2, which one is a preferred vitamin form? What is the difference? And who would benefit from additional vitamin D? How much does one need? And why does the immune system need vitamin D? So vitamin D is a fat soluble secosteroid hormone and it's stored in the liver and the fat. It's important for enhancing calcium and phosphorus uptake uh, in the small intestine because it increases the uh, expression of transporter proteins in, in this area, and this improves the absorption of these minerals. The primary benefit is uh, maintaining adequate calcium levels for strong bones and preventing rickets. Of course, calcium is involved in other important uh, cellular functions. So before we continue discussing vitamin D, it's important to understand how it is made by the body and how we obtain it from the diet. In humans and other animals, ultraviolet B rays in the form of uh, sunshine <clears throat> cleave the seven dehydrocholesterol, which is in the skin, and this becomes pre-vitamin D3. This form undergoes a structural change, which then converts it to vitamin D3. We can also obtain this from the diet in certain fortified foods and, and foods like fishes or in a supplement. It's also known that a molecule called ergosterol in the fruiting body of mushrooms can be converted to vitamin D2 by exposure to sunshine or ultraviolet B rays. And uh, this can be obtained in the diet from eating by eating mushrooms that, of course, have been exposed to sunlight. The difference between uh, D2 and D3 is a methyl group that's highlighted here on a carbon uh, in this, uh, that's highlighted in this circle. So both of these forms uh, can be carried in the blood to the liver, and there they're converted to a vitamin, uh, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D3, or D2, and, and for D3, it's also known as calcifidiol or calcidiol. And um, <clears throat> this form is generally inactive and it's the form that's measured in your blood by, the phys by your physician to determine your vitamin D status. So when the body needs the active form of vitamin D, that's the 1-alpha-25-dihydroxy vitamin D3, also known as calcitriol, this conversion occurs primarily in the kidney with regards to uh, maintaining calcium levels. However, there are other cells that can carry out this conversion, including um, uh, immune cells. So um, just briefly, uh, there's some discussion as to whether vitamin D3 is preferred over vitamin D2 as a supplement. And um, there are chain differences in how the body hand handles these two forms. So if you take the same dose, say 50,000 IU, that the serum levels of your 25 hydroxy D will increase similarly. However, as you go, as you watch over time, what happens, you can see that the D2 form clears from the blood more rapidly than the D D3 form, which tends to stay at high levels for at least a month after this large intake. So um, while taking large doses and waiting for a long time may not be ideal for D3, D2, if you take it daily, it should be uh, one way to maintain levels of vitamin D. And this may be something that's preferred by individuals who do not want to consume animal products. 
So <clears throat> how does vitamin D work in the body? Well, <clears throat> vitamin D mediates its effects on the cell via the vitamin D receptor. And this is a transcription factor that is activated upon binding of the active form of vitamin D. So you have synthesis of 25-hydroxy-D and in the body, an enzyme converts that 25 to 125 as we discussed. And this 125-dihydroxyvitamin D then interacts with its receptor. And this receptor can turn on the expression of genes in the nucleus. And so, um, Many of these genes are involved in classical functions such as calcium uptake and, and uh, bone, bone health. And then they're involved also genes involved in uh, non-classical functions such as uh, cancer chemo prevention, um, uh, antibacterial responses and anti-inflammatory responses and uh, perhaps anti-hypertensive uh, responses. So <clears throat> These are generally considered, considered non-classical functions. And the reason that uh, vitamin D has, uh, the vitamin D pathway has uh, such an effect on uh, numerous uh, systems is that most, the vitamin D receptor is expressed in most cells and uh, most tissues of the body. And over a thousand genes are regulated by uh, the vitamin D receptor. And uh, it's ligand, the active form of vitamin D. So it's the fact that so many genes are regulated by vitamin D highlights uh, that uh, adequate levels of the 25-hydroxy-D are important. And so inadequate uh, levels are still an ongoing health concern worldwide. And in this study uh, by Hilger and colleagues, they looked at 100, almost 168,000 participants from the general population and measured mean serum in, in, and they basically aggregated studies that were um, looking at mean serum 25-hydroxy-D levels. And they found that if you use the endocrinology cutoffs of 75 nanomole per liter or 30 nanogram per mil serum 25, that 88% of people were insufficient. And <clears throat> if you use the cutoff of the Institute of Medicine, which was 20 nanogram per mil or 50 nanomole per liter, 37% of individuals had insufficient levels of uh, serum 25B. And six points, almost 7% of the population was deficient. And this just uh, arrow points out the US here. You can see the circle size is the, how many participants were in the study. The green is, is sufficient, adequate levels. Yellow and orange and red would be uh, inadequate to deficient levels. So you can still see that there are a number of people worldwide that don't get enough vitamin D. So what factors affect 25-hydroxy-D levels? What is the climate and weather? So seasons in the winter, we don't synthesize vitamin D. When we are north of uh, 35 degrees latitude or south in the winter in the south, uh, skin pigmentation or clothing, darker skinned individuals make less vitamin D on sun exposure. Clothing and sunscreen block the production of vitamin D by the skin. Age is important, so cholesterol content of the skin decreases. So that component, the 7-dihydrocholesterol, is uh, present at lower levels in the skin of older people. Also mobility, if you're not getting outside, you're not able to synthesize vitamin D. Um, obesity. These individuals tend to have low circulating levels of serum 25-hydroxy-D, and then diet and supplement usage. So depending on your diet, um, you may have very little vitamin D content in your food. And this is particularly an issue for vegans, and vegetarians, and, and so forth. So uh, it, considering the factors that affect serum 25, then it is uh, stands to reason that older individuals are going to be uh, could, could benefit from increased vitamin D intake. Individuals with darker skin or those who uh, cover their bodies with clothing um, or avoid sun exposure. <clears throat> Nursing care, home residents, um, vegetarians and vegans and hospitalized patients are all um, individuals who could benefit. And with regards to vegetarians and vegans, it's interesting to note, uh, I found this on a vitamin D website, 
And when you look at this, you realize there's there's very little vitamin D present here, and possibly with the exception of mushrooms. So if you um, are able to find these in the store, you can get mushrooms that have been exposed to ultraviolet B rays, and they are actually a good source of vitamin D. But when you look at the foods that are actually rich in vitamin D, they're, they're fatty fishes like tuna, mackerel, salmon, or fortified foods like dairy products, orange juice, soy milk, and cereals. And then there's beef, liver, cheese, and egg yolks that also have vitamin D. So these are generally not uh, probably consumed in large quantities by vegetarians and vegans, except for some of the uh, fortified soy milk, perhaps cereals. So how much does one need? LPI recommendations are for a daily intake of vitamin D in healthy adults of 2,000 IU per day, uh, infants 400 to 1,000 IU per day, children and adolescents 600 to 1,000 IU per day, and the upper limit that's been set by the IOM is 4,000 IU per day. Um, our recommendations are higher than the current IOM recommendations, which are 600 for healthy adults and 800 for those older than 70 and uh, I believe 400 for children. So we are um, recommending a bit higher and we feel that this, this is important in, in making sure that most people can reach um, serum levels uh, that are say 30 to 60 nanogram per mil, at least reaching 30. And we recommend that people maintain their serum 25 hydroxy concentrations at this level. So <clears throat> we've gotten through some introductory material. Um, now it's time to consider why does the immune system need vitamin D? Well, historically, sources of vitamin D um, were used to treat tuberculosis. And this was some of the first, uh, one of the earlier clues that sources of vitamin D were important in immune function. So it was known that cod liver oil could effectively or could help a number of patients with uh, tuberculosis. We also are probably aware that cod liver oil is considered healthy because it does have vitamin D in it, it also has vitamin A. And sanatoriums were used quite a bit in the eight, late 1800s and early 1900s to treat patients with tuberculosis. And they found that people people's health improved quite a bit, but at the time they didn't actually know what what, was, what the benefit was from. And, uh, and in the 1940s, um, by the 1940s, they had already been isolating uh, vitamin D in the form of vitamin D2 from, from yeast that was irradiated with light. And um, they uh, could uh, give uh, purified forms of vitamin D2 to um, patients. And a physician found that he could, uh, named Sharpie, found that he could use a uh, 600,000 IU dose of vitamin D2 and alcohol to treat patients who had lupus vulgaris, which is a mycobacterium tuberculosis infection of the skin. And here's a patient, um, an example of a patient who had been living with this condition that dis disfigures this, the face quite uh, terribly. And um, they put them on a treatment where in the first week they got three doses of, of the 600,000 IU, then for the second through fourth weeks, two doses per week, and then once per month indefinitely. And you can see that there was quite a dramatic improvement in the condition of this patient. Um, this was seen in a lot of patients, and uh, but it eventually fell out of uh, use once uh, antibiotics uh, to treat this uh, bacterial infection were, were discovered. However, this was also a very uh, strong indicator that vitamin D was having a major effect on immune response. And then over the uh, ensuing decades, it was noted that vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency correlated with increased susceptibility to mycobacterium um, infection, bacterial infections, but in particular mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis infections. Um, it was also discovered back in the 80s that activated macrophages, which are a really important um, innate immune cell for uh, fighting infection, particularly, uh, not surprisingly, mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. 
um, could metabolize the 25 hydroxy D to the 125 dihydroxy uh, vitamin D. And that active form uh, needed to turn on genes. And it was also found that if you provided this uh, active form of vitamin D uh, to immune cells like mac macrophages, you could increase their ability to um, basically engulf and kill bacteria, uh, including uh, mycobacterial, um, mycobacterial uh, um, pathogens. Uh, by, and that uh, this, oops, excuse me, that uh, in the early 2000s, my group and others discovered that this also led to increased expression of an antimicrobial peptide um, and in these cells. This, this is just a Western blot that allows us to detect protein, and this was uh, something my group did. We found that if we took these macrophage-like cells and we gave them vitamin D, shown the active form of vitamin D shown by the plus, and compared cells that did not receive the vitamin D, um, there was a dramatic increase in the expression of this protein. And uh, this is the cathelicidin antimicrobial peptide. So these were all uh, very interesting findings, and um, there was a lot of renewed interest, but not only does vitamin D regulate the antimicrobial peptide, it also um, has a major effect on the, um, ex the differentiation of um, immune cells in the innate immune system, which would be monocytes and macrophages and dendritic cells. And it also has major effects on uh, the uh, function of T cells and B cells. And so this table is not, not meant to mean a whole lot to you as far as all of these different names, but these are all genes that are involved in immune response. And vitamin D is either directly or indirectly regulating expression of these genes. And that can be through uh, binding to their promoters or by affecting the cells that express them. But um, in monocytes and macrophages and dendritic cells, we see increased expression of antimicrobial peptides. We see in macrophages increased phagocytosis, which, which is the engulfing of pathogen. We see um, um, <clears throat> effects on T cell differentiation. So increased T regs, which are good as far as um, decreasing inflammation. And we see a decrease in inflammatory T cells like Th1 and Th17. Um, we see decreased cytokine, inflammatory cytokine expression in monocytes and macrophages. And in T cells, we see increased T reg cell differentiation and um, alterations in homing to skin and other inflamed tissues. And we also see uh, decreases in inflammatory cytokines. So these, um, these findings with um, vitamin D show that there's ma a major impact of vitamin D on immune cell function and, and uh, activity. So is vitamin D good for your immune system? Well, these findings, and of course, uh, uh, in uh, together with the epidemiological studies that have been done, show that um, there's a connection of vitamin D to reducing the risk of autoimmune diseases, um, reducing inflammatory um, properties, um, such as uh, the potential risk of cytokine storm. And this is particularly an issue with acute respiratory distress syndrome, which can occur with viral infections. And we're quite familiar with that with COVID and it can reduce the risk from infectious disease. So vitamin D supplementation um, uh, has been shown to reduce the risk of acute respiratory infection, tract infection uh, from a, a very large meta-analysis study that was done by uh, Martineau et al. in 2017. What they did was they collected all of the data from individuals who participated in clinical trials and these were randomized double-blind placebo RCTs of supplementation with vitamin D3 or D2. And the study had to be looking at the incidence of acute respiratory tract infection 
and this had to be uh, part of the study design so that it was collected prospectively and it was pre-specified as an efficacy outcome. They uh, found 25 eligible studies and they obtained the data for 10, almost 11,000 participants. They found when they analyzed this data that vitamin D supplementation reduced the risk of acute respiratory infection among all participants by 12%. That doesn't seem very, like, very much, but when they did a subgroup analysis, they found that um, the protective effects were seen in those receiving daily or weekly doses rather than large doses of one once every month or several months. And they found that the protective effects were stronger in those with a baseline 25 hydroxy vitamin D level below 10 nanogram per mil. And that was, they saw 70% reduced risk of acute respiratory infection. So that's quite dramatic. And even those who had higher than 10 nanogram per mil showed a 25% reduced risk um, for infection. So um, clearly there were um, some uh, very important uh, effects of vitamin D supplementation in this uh, that were uncovered in this analysis. The good thing was vitamin D did not have any influence on serious adverse events. So it was safe and it protected against acute respiratory infections overall. So what does that mean in re with respect to uh, COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic? Well, there's been a lot of interest in vitamin D and, and COVID because of reasons that we've been discussing. And uh, what studies are finding is that um, uh, a number of studies, observational studies, and not all of them, but they are finding that vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency correlates with the increased risk of infection. So uh, a, retrospective co a number of retrospective cohort studies, looking at one case, 190,000 US residents showed that um, uh, Increasing serum concentrations of 25-hydroxy-D lowered the risk of uh, SARS of a patient being uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive. In Israel, 7,800 patients um, were looked at, and those with less than 30 nanogram per mil serum 25-hydroxy-D had a 50% or higher risk of infection. And a number of small case control studies and meta-analyses have uh, supported these findings here. Small number of studies show that COVID-19 severity is associated with low vitamin D status, and one case control found no link, and three studies found a link to mortality, but uh, two did not. So um, this has raised a lot of interest, and a number of random control trials are now underway to address vitamin D supplementation in COVID-19 prevention and treatment. But what we would conclude is that the currently available data indicate improving vitamin D status through supplementation rep represents a modifiable risk factor for COVID-19. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take those. Thanks, Fritz, for that talk. Um, I, I know a couple of people were having audio problems during the, the presentation, so um, hopefully we've got some of those addressed. I'll try to speak up, uh, project as much as I can. Um, and so I think I think for the benefit of, of the people who were having some audio issues and hopefully they can hear us better now, um, Maybe we should just go over some of the, the major effects of, of vitamin D in the immune system. I mean, you, you talked about vitamin D having uh, a myriad effects on uh, B cells and T cells. It has um, antimicrobial functions. Um, can you go a little further into the, the work with the acute respiratory infections? These are this, these infections that you were talking about um, are... They're they're kind of undefined, right? Uh, right. I mean the the um, the interest in vitamin D as far as these uh, the development of acute respiratory distress syndrome would be um, based on the the um, findings that vitamin the vitamin D has an impact on the expression of these um, 
um, anti these inflammatory cytokines. So it, it tends to have a dampening effect on the expression of these um, uh, inflammatory cytokines, which are what are out of control when this situation develops. So the thought is if you have deficient levels of vitamin D, 25 hydroxy D, um, that you don't have uh, sufficient substrate for production of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3, which is going to then activate the vitamin D receptor, turn on uh, expression of genes, or even turn down the expression of genes, and have M the effect that uh, the effect that the 125 has on these uh, immune cells like uh, T cells and um, macrophages and so forth in the site of the infection. Um, this is, so uh, whether vitamin D actually, you know, if you supplement will actually affect these outcomes is not as clear, but based on a lot of in vitro work and work in animals, um, this is sort of what the, uh, the, the, uh, the thought is as far as uh, vitamin D goes. And the studies that have been done in people, um, there's, there's some support for that. Not all studies support that. A lot of it is correlating deficiency with outcomes. Sure, sure. I, I was, I think I was specific, specifically talking about the uh, ARI meta-analysis that you went over. Um, oh. These infections, I mean, they, they came from various sources, right? They, they weren't really defined what caused. Right, it wasn't, the, the right. infections weren't necessarily defined. It was sort of a broad classification of acute respiratory tract so infections. So we could, you could be talking about that could be Many influenza infections, yeah. um, cold. Uh, yes. Okay. Different well, types of. I know everyone's going to be interested, and in there's. I've already saw a request uh, for the the last slide in your slide deck again. Um, we will make these slides available to everyone after after the presentation is over. Um, but and we'll go over the COVID information again in just a moment. But. Um, we kind of go to a little bit of the basics of your talk, uh, some of the questions that we received in pre-registration. A lot of people are interested in knowing where the cutoffs for vitamin D levels, blood levels are. Um, you know, what what is considered good? What is considered bad? Is there a level that's considered too much? Right. Um, so there's, um, there is, it's, it's not, probably not um, surprising that there's confusion. Um, so the in 2010, the Institute of Medicine decided that uh, sufficiency would be set at 20 nanogram per mil or um, uh, 75 or 50 nanomolar uh, per liter. And that was based on uh, requirements for uh, bone health. And um, so because of the the um, the other the other potential effects of vitamin D on other health health health, health outcomes, um, the endocrinology the American Endocrinology Society uh, set it at uh, thirty nanogram per mil, which is what it was before the IOM uh, changed it to twenty. Um, so that's caused some confusion. Uh, at the LPI, we we are going with the Endocrine Society uh, guidelines of thirty. Okay. And um, we're we're saying we're recommending keeping it between thirty to sixty. Um, there's probably not any benefit going over sixty nanogram per mil. And, and as you get higher and higher levels, there's the, always the potential for perhaps uh, um, unwanted side effects. Although um, it's generally thought that you could probably reach up close to 150 nanogram per mil and still not uh, uh, suffer any ill effects. But um, it's not clear that being having levels that high are necessarily any more beneficial. Um, so basically, we recommend between thirty to sixty nanograms per mil. So, but if if an individual got their uh, vitamin D level tested, their blood vitamin D level tested, and came back with something close to a hundred, you wouldn't necessarily be concerned, but wouldn't necessarily ask them to continue supplement. Is that is that fair? Don't, or? I, I yeah, I, I don't know if I'd be concerned, but and that's that's a pretty pretty good okay. level there. Okay. Um, you may not need to take as much of the sup if you are sup taking a supplement. You may not need to take as much as you're taking because it's probably not necessary to be that high. Although um, you know the studies in lifeguards have shown 
that when they spend their time out in the sun during the summer, they get levels that approach approach that or go higher. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, so a lot of people have asked, um, they're having difficulty raising their blood vitamin D. I mean, we, we focus on blood vitamin D as right. the marker, right? right? But what about the people who are in trouble getting to that level, that threshold? Right. So, you know, they're measuring 25 hydroxy vitamin D in your blood. Uh, to determine your status. And uh, it's a frequent question to get from, from folks saying, I, I'm taking a supplement, but my, my levels are not increasing. And I've even, I'm not an endocrinologist, but I've spoken to my colleagues who are endocrinologists and work on vitamin D. And they, they say that this, this, this question is not uncommon and it's not entirely clear why, why that's happening. But there are a number of studies that are done, uh, genome, they're, they're basically these genome-wide studies that are done with uh, um, uh, these uh, nucleotide polymorphisms that are in genes um, that are involved in, in vitamin D metabolism. And so some of those genes were on that slide where I went over the chemical structures and synthesis of vitamin D. So genes like the CYP2R um, or the CYP20, uh, CYP24A1 wasn't on there. That's a, a gene that makes a protein that breaks down vitamin D. And there's also a gene that regulates the production of the uh, 7-dehydrocholesterol. And, and there are variants in these genes that um, do seem to uh, have an impact on serum levels of 25D. So it's possible individuals that have uh, uh, uh oh variants. In oh, for sure, having a little. It's it's not clear, uh, really clear, uh, <laughs> what is happening there. I think we just had a little hiccup in your internet uh, right there, uh, Fritz. Yeah. Did um, I cut out there? Yeah. All right. So moment. it may be that there's very these genes, uh, variants in these genes that metabolize vitamin D that are responsible for some individuals not reaching or having increases in their levels. Sorry about so, that. So SNPs or individual gene variation may be one influencing factor. Right. How about um, people have asked about, say, obesity or um, maybe other uh, vitamins and minerals or, or, uh, maybe drugs. Yeah. Are there, you know, are those, uh, possible like interactions between drugs that people are taking as possible way of, uh, there's some, some drugs like anticonvulsants have been attributed to increasing, um, the, uh, production of the enzyme that breaks down vitamin D. Uh, there's also, um, possibility that, um, you may be magnesium deficient. So okay. there's, there's, there's work showing that magnesium in, increasing your magnesium levels uh, and uh, improve your vitamin D serum levels okay. because magnesium is an important cofactor for these enzymes that regulate, regulate metabolism of vitamin D. Um, yeah. So I think in general, there are a lot of fact, things that can go into why your vitamin D levels aren't going up. There could be yeah. Mag um, magnesium deficiency is, yeah. is one that now is, is there's a lot of interest in. Right. Yes. And, and I, I heard about that one uh, quite a while ago and that uh, personally helped me with my vitamin D uh, levels, but uh, I know other people who, who have not seen the same effect. So it's, it's kind of um, got to be careful with, uh, with what works for one person may not work for you. Um, well, sure. let's, let's go with, uh, let's turn our attention to vitamin D forms. People, a lot of people have asked even today um, about D2 and D3. Is there any, for, for, I guess, first of all, is there any reason to supplement with both D2 and D3? To supplement with both? Um, yeah. I don't, or, or get a source. I don't, of both. I don't think I'd, I'd necessarily, uh, you know, supplement with both and just pick one uh, there. Um, I know there are, are, are people who don't want to take a, an, an animal form of vitamin D, which would be the vitamin D3. Mm -hmm. So there's interest in, in something that's a, an option there. And vitamin D2 is, is, is the one that is probably the, the best option there. It's, it's derived from uh, a fungal source. Um, and I think if you take it daily, that it keeps your, your serum levels of, of vitamin D uh, where you want them. Uh, it's maybe not good for bolus dosing. Bolus dosing refers to taking large doses, say once a month or maybe even once a week. And actually, one thing that came out of the uh, 
acute respiratory uh, tract infection study that I mentioned by uh, Adrian Martineau was that um, people who benefited the best were taking a daily dose of uh, vitamin D supplement and not bolus doses. And um, they did say also weekly, but uh, in speaking with him recently, uh, I think he believes that daily uh, supplementation is probably best even better than okay. taking weekly doses. Oh. So there seems to be something important about getting vitamin D each day uh, versus large doses intermittently. So yeah, that was that actually answers one of our questions that we, we received, which was, you know, which is the best regimen for vitamin D supplementation if you choose to supplement? Right, and I um, would recommend taking it daily. Daily. Um, People do ask about injections, though, um, or or the large bolus um, oral supplementation. Are those considered safe, or are there any side effects to doing um, large amounts like that? There are sometimes there are, are large doses given uh, by physicians to people who have uh, really low serum levels of twenty five um, D three. And that's to quickly uh, raise the levels because it it does take some time for your levels to come up. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're low, um, I, I don't believe that's been shown to be unsafe generally for okay. people. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't recommend taking those doses every day for long periods of time. But uh, the there is a there is there are concerns about large bolus dosing to maintain your levels and uh, say hundred thousand IU per month or you know several hundred thousand for the for three months. And that's that you might actually uh, activate uh, metabolism in your your body that that affects vitamin D in a way that perhaps you don't want want to, to have uh, occur. So that's why it might be better to to get it in in, a, in sort of a daily regimen rather than really large doses that then activate certain met metabolic pathways. That makes sense. I, I guess you know at that point your body may be seeing it as more of not a toxin exactly, but just something to be gotten rid of. Uh, because there's too much of it around. And so that, um, sorry, I cut out again. So oh, no, it's okay. I was just, I was just kind of, I was going to say it's, uh, you're, um, taking large bolus doses may activate certain metabolic pathways that can, um, uh, have a negative effect on vitamin D. Um, so let's see, there's, uh, actually I'll, I'll ask this question. Um, a lot of people have also asked about this. What about vitamin D combined with vitamin K? Is is there benefits to taking both together? Are, are there synergies? Are there additive effects of vitamin D and K? It's it's uh, it's it's thought that um, <clears throat> getting adequate levels of vitamin K are probably important in the function of vitamin D and 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 also adequate vitamin D levels in the function of K. Um, overall, the effect would be to improve uh, bone strength by getting adequate levels of both and uh, to reduce the possibility of calcification in soft tissues like the heart. Um, I'm not a vitamin K expert, but from what I understand, uh, generally you can get enough in your diet. If you eat a diet with rich in leafy green vegetables and um, what, a, what else is good for K? Uh, Natto, sure, <laughs> fermented a, foods, actually, some fermented of the, foods, some yeah. of the meats and, and things like that. So there are um, there are ways to get vitamin K, and, and most and, and from what I understand, most people do get enough if you eat a, a varied diet. So you, I don't know if supplementing is necessarily uh, needed, um, but you do want to have added. It's probably good to have adequate K, ad, adequate magnesium as well, which you can get from leafy green vegetables and some other foods. Um, but as far as I, I don't think there's enough data out there yet to to, to uh, make decisions about, um, um, you know, basically combining D and K and so forth. But basically, if you're eating a healthy diet and you're getting adequate, you should just make sure you're getting adequate levels of the different micronutrients because definitely they don't act in a vacuum. Vitamin D is not acting alone. It's it's probably there are interactions with mm -hmm. K, interactions with magnesium, perhaps some other. Uh, micronutrients that are important so and certainly people have been uh concerned and some of our questions are along these lines is taking d in the absence of calcium bad is taking d with too much calcium bad is you know do you have to worry about calcium at the same time that you're worried about your d supplementation um yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And again, I'm not a calcium expert, but, um, <laughs> but I would say that, um, it, trying to get, make sure you get enough, you know, adequate levels of calcium in, in your diet. And, uh, but, and, and then many of these mic micronutrients we can get in our diet. Vitamin D is one of those rare ones where it's, it's, it's fairly difficult to, to get enough vitamin D in your diet. And that's why we recommend a, a, a standalone supplement to, to make up for any inadequate inadequacies in, in diet. Because um, as I mentioned, there's just a few foods that have um, significant levels of vitamin D. Otherwise you'd have to, you know, you'd have to eat a whole lot of eggs or a whole lot of drink, a lot of milk to get to, uh, to the, um, international unit numbers that we talk about. Yeah, that's true. Dietary sources should be pretty low for most dietary sources. Um, so, so let's turn then to sunlight, you know, um, people have, have been asking some questions about sunlight and, and um, understanding is the vitamin D from sunlight somehow different from the vitamin D that we're taking in the, the D3 that we're getting in supplements? Uh, is there any benefit to getting it from sunlight? Um, well, the vitamin D that you synthesize in your, your skin and ultimately um, in the metabolism that goes on after it leaves the skin is um, going to be identical to to the supplement that you um and buy and consume am i still there okay yeah 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 yep. okay yep. um sorry sometimes my internet is, <laughs> i don't know today has been a problem uh so um the vitamin d3 that you buy as a supplement is going to be identical to what you synthesize in your body okay uh but as far as sun exposure there's a whole lot of other things that happen in your skin uh, with sun exposure, and there are other there are other uh, compounds that are synthesized, and there's a lot of interest in what those are and, and the benefits of those. So, um, sun exposure is going to be different from just say taking a supplement because of the the potentially other added benefits from that. But then, of course, there's the opposite, which is stay in the sun too long. Right, and you got the the right the negative effects of being right. So you, you you don't want to get you don't want to get a sunburn. Yeah, and. No. So if you want to use the sun to make vitamin D, you may want to go out for a few minutes, synthesize uh, some vitamin D and then put on your sunscreen. Actually, that, that, that's a great question or brings up a great question right there is like, how long does it take? I mean, um, obviously uh, it depends on your latitude. Right. So uh, there are, there, I, I don't, I don't have uh, the website remembered or memorized, but um, there are uh, links to websites you can uh, go to and calculate yeah. how long you need to be exposed uh, to the sun to synthesize a certain number of international units of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. um, you can check those out and uh, put in the numbers and they take in latitude, uh, time of year, and uh, even the surface that you might be sta uh, standing on, whether it's concrete or sand or grass. And also how much your body is, how much of your body is exposed. And you can, you can calculate how much uh, vitamin D you can synthesize. Somebody like myself, say in the noonday sun, um, in uh, the middle of summer, might be able to synthesize a thousand IU in about seven to 10 minutes. Okay. Before, you know, before any kind of s s sunburn would occur. But in a nice Oregon winter, we're, right. we're out of luck. In the of, yes. And, and so... <laughs> If you're living between 35 degrees uh, north or south latitude um, during the winter months, you, there should be enough uh, UVB rays in the sun to synthesize vitamin D. It's just when you go beyond those north or south mm -hmm. during the winter months for about uh, four or five months from November to March, uh, there's not enough UVB rays to synthesize vitamin D. So uh, some sort of other sources such as a supplement or foods that are rich in vitamin D would be the best option. So um, a couple of, a couple of people have asked about vitamin D as is nature is a hormone. Um, why is it called a vitamin? If it's a hormone, uh, if it's a steroid um, or, you know, it's, if, if it's a steroid hormone. Right. It's like a steroid hormone, which means that one of the rings is cleaved. Is, is it a, I mean, I, 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 the reason it's a, it is, a, it is a hormone. It was, it's, the reason it's called vitamin D is it was discovered in, in food sources initially when uh, researchers were studying uh, studying the vitamin. Um, 
they uh, found that they could feed certain things to rats that they made deficient uh, by feeding them a diet that was low in vitamin D. They could feed them, let's say, oatmeal. And the rats would, for a long period of time, they would not get, be getting any vitamin D. They'd keep them in the, the dark, basically. And these rats would get problems like bone, bone problems and so forth. Uh, they found they could then feed, uh, feed them things that were irradiated and, uh, or uh, just feed them uh, things from uh, rats that were not in the dark and, and like um, bedding material and, and, and this would reverse it. So it was initially found through consumption that they could correct the deficiency. So it was called a vitamin. Essentially, that's sort of how it came about. And it wasn't yeah. until later that they determined that it, that it was actually being synthesized in the skin with sun exposure. So uh, another way of, of I mean, we, we, we define vitamins, I guess, in two different ways. One of which is something that comes from our diet, but also as something that corrects a, new, uh, a deficiency in the diet. And so um, the, we, the name still yeah, sticks, yeah. you know, it, it uh, you can sticks. use dietary vitamin D well, yeah. yes, <laughs> to, you to correct you your deficiency. It. Yes, you could. Yeah. Um, so, okay, let's let's turn our attention back to COVID-19 because I know a lot of people are going to be interested in that information. Um, you, sh you showed some of the, the synopsis of, of vitamin D and COVID, but um, I know there's a lot of papers showing up all the time about vitamin D and COVID. Um, and do you have any word of, of caution on, on viewing these articles? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different um, study designs out there. A word of caution. Um, I think you think we want to focus on peer-reviewed papers. There are a lot of um, there are a number. Of, you know, now papers are being deposited in pre preprint preprint servers. Those preprints mm -hmm. aren't necessarily peer-reviewed. We've had there have been examples of papers that have uh, not un, not been able to get through the peer review process. There've been issues with them. There's been uh, examples of papers that have gone through the peer review process. It's not it's not bulletproof, but um, then uh, issues arise, and so uh, it's it's kind of the wild west out there with this. What I would say about vitamin D and immunity in immunity is there's clearly a role for vitamin D in in, in the immune immune system, and that comes from a sort of a preponderance of a lot of in vitro work, which is you know not necessarily ideal, but um, and then combining that with uh, clinical studies, um, epidemiological studies, the associations with deficiency and so forth, mm -hmm. so taking all of this ev evidence uh, together. And, and then, of course, observational studies. Um, we know that it's important in the immune system. And what we want to make sure people do is make sure they're getting enough vitamin D so that their immune system can function properly. Whether I don't think you should think about, um, oh, COVID's coming through, I better just start loading up um, when you when you get sick. What you want to do is you want to keep your levels, you want to keep your levels uh, up all the time so that when you do encounter something, your body will respond uh, properly. The immune system can function properly. I think the best example of why we think vitamin D is so important is macrophages, uh, which I mentioned, they're important in fighting infection and particularly mycobacterium tuberculosis is, is one where the macrophage is really important. And I think this is why this, why this came out in, in the, the years, in many years ago, that there was a, a, an association of vitamin D with mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. And that's um, when the macrophage encounters a pathogen, it activates the production of 125 from 25 so if you have really low circulating 25 in your system, you won't have enough present to convert to 125. And the 125 is turning on these genes that we know uh, fight infection, like the antimicrobial peptide. Mm -hmm. So with COVID uh, these, and this peptide, as well as other genes that are regulated by vitamin D are important in, count in uh, fighting viral infections as well as bacterial infections. So, <clears throat> Does vitamin D help you with COVID? I would say vitamin D helps you with probably many types of infection and, and the coronavirus infection and the development of the COVID disease are going to probably be impacted by your vitamin D status. Um, these studies are, again, suggesting there's importance and I, I would agree that there's probably something important there. Uh, whether you can treat with high doses of vitamin D, I'm not sure, um, but I do think at least maintaining adequate levels um, goes a long way in 
perhaps reducing your risk of infection and perhaps reducing the severity. And, and of course, there's, there are studies now being designed and, and, and started that are going to be looking at uh, the, 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 the use of, of supplementation um, in patients who um, get infected and become uh, develop COVID. Uh, and, and I think we'll have to wait and see how that turns out. I think, I mean, some important notes are, you know, this, the, the, a lot of the studies that we're seeing on vitamin D are in patients, right? People are, have already shown up at a hospital for some severe. Um, they're not really looking at people who are necessarily living at home. And so we've already got a subset of, of a group uh, that kind of self-selected group. They've already got some sort of uh, problem. Right. Um, and also those study designs are very different. I mean, I, I looked at some today that lo used large oral bolus doses, as you mentioned, and some used daily supplementation. Some even used um, uh, cal calcidiol. Can you can you talk right. about you know calcidiol right. a little bit and there, how that's making so some use? There's interest in calcidiol because um, calcidiol refers to the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. That's the form okay. that uh, circulates in your blood. Um, if uh, there's interest in that as a supplement because it raises your serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels more, much more rapidly than taking the vitamin D supplement because it bypasses the uh, metabolism that has to occur in the liver. So there's interest in them using that to raise levels very, very quickly. Um, there was a study on that, uh, that where that was used in some um, patients in the um, in Spain, um, I've heard that there may be some questions about the study mm -hmm. yep. um, as yep. far as, as the validity of the results. There were some uh, problems being pointed out in design and so forth. Um, so it, I think it remains to be seen uh, whether that's also going to be useful, but um, it, it, it clearly does raise levels more quickly. And if that's important in certain conditions, it might be an, a, a viable uh, option Thank for you. supplementation, but it's 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 considered um, at this point. I think it's considered a drug in the United right. States. Yeah, the FDA is still um, regulating it as a drug, even though you find 25 hydroxy D in food sources like eggs and, and certain meats and livers and so forth. But it's a, a much lower levels than say the uh, vitamin D itself. So I think the bottom line for the Lions Pauling Institute, at least, was you know after the pandemic started and all these papers appeared for vitamin D, our, our recommendations really haven't changed. Um, we, we're still recommending people take vitamin C, D supplements to get their levels up, regardless of what the current infectious disease circulating the planet is. Right. I, and I think, again, if your levels are really, you know, if you get a measurement and your levels are low, you may want to work with your physician to raise those levels quickly. And you can do that by taking higher doses than, say, 2,000 IU. You know, uh, the upper limit's 4,000 IU, but... It's not un uncommon to take 10,000 or 20,000 or even 50,000, mm -hmm. depending on how rapidly you want to increase those levels. Um, and then you can back down to a lower level and maintain maintain your serum levels. And I'm going to probably have to close it on this question here, but um, that that raises kind of a logistical concern during the pandemic is, you know, not you can't always get out and get your blood levels checked. Uh, in the middle of a public health crisis. Oh, um, people want to know if you, can, you should t check your levels regularly. I mean, what can you do if you can't, for some reason, check your levels? I mean, is it just um, continue on at a normal dose and, and um, do yeah, the best just you Yeah, I would just keep taking your supplement. Yeah. Um, I, it's not that difficult to check. There are, there are companies that will uh, do those uh, blood spot tests. Mail order, companies. mail order. Yeah. yeah, basically you can contact them. They'll send you the kit. You can do your blood spot test, and 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 those those are 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 pretty good for for getting a, a number. And they're not uh, terribly expensive, from what I remember. Is yeah, that somewhere around fifty to seventy five dollars. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I'm going to have to leave it there. Um, we're we're kind of at time, and and uh, but I'd like to thank you, Fritz, for all of your time today and that presentation, answering all our questions. Uh, it was great having you here. Thanks, um, everybody, for participating. And so um, now I'm just going to.
Sorry about that. Um, ask Emily Ho to come back on uh, to to kind of lead us out for this uh, webinar. Emily? Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you for all your, all your time with us today. Hopefully in the spirit of uh, Linus Pauling, we hope uh, you learned a little bit more about how to live better longer using the science and nutrition. Um, don't forget to check out our website. Uh, we'll have uh, the PowerPoint presentation, um, this webinar, and all of our previous webinars uh, there. Um, I also encourage you to check out our Micronutrient Information Center, which is also on our website for even more information. And many of the answers to your questions um, are all about vitamin D are, are, are there as, as well in our vitamin D article. So please check that out. Um, all the research presented here and all the resources that the uh, Institute has for you are provided and funded by many of our generous supporters. So people like you who have a, a passion for nutrition science. So um, love to hear from you. If you have more ideas on webinar topics or topics you'd like to hear about, we'd love to hear about it. Also, encourage you to consider donating to the Linus Paul Institute. Uh, no gift is too small. Um, every little bit makes a big difference in helping us produce um, content uh, like we have here today. Uh, so for more information, you, know, you can always send us an email. Uh, check out our website uh, for ways to support and give. Uh, lastly, want to give a big shout out. Thank you to Dr. Gombart for sharing um, his research um, and lending his expertise. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Michaels uh, for being a great moderator. Um, thank you for behind the scenes, Isabel Nissen and Nancy Shanks from the OSU Foundation for all their help uh, with the webinar as well. And as well as uh, uh, Dr. Drake, who is the, uh, the director of the Micronutrient Information Center. Lastly, just big thanks to all of you for being here and caring about your health. Uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.